at the time you were getting interested in um, atomic physics and quantum computing, what was the real state of the art? So people were working with systems of cold atoms and trapping them, uh, doing atomic clocks. Like what, what was really working at the time? Because of course there were no quantum computers at the yes. time. Yes. So to kind of, you know, go back um, to the origins. So um, it actually goes back to the point where laser was invented. And when laser was invented, uh, I don't know if you read the history, you know, books, you know, so some people said that laser is a, a kind of solution looking for an application or something like that. So people they really... looking for a nail. Yes, pe people did not quite know. I mean, it was clear that this lasers is a fascinating object that you can produce, like, you know, very high intensity, directed, coherent light. But it really was not clear, you know, if and how lasers will change the world. And, you know, we now know that, you know, how lasers can change the world um, in terms of, you know, many areas uh, of human activity. We actually would not be able to, you know, even, uh, you know, listen to this broadcast without things like fiber optics, you know. But um, also very early on, people started to realize that laser is a very special tool for uh, kind of manipulating matter. And one of the very early ideas, uh, which was actually proposed, among others, by Vladimir Litokhov, you know, whose picture one can actually see, you know, uh, but here, so, um, uh, was to basically use um, lasers, uh, for example, to uh, slow down the atomic motion. And it was, the idea was to use light pressure, uh, and these uh, kind of ideas and kind of eventually, uh, you know, flourished into the fields such as, for example, laser cooling and trapping. So you can use lasers to basically bring atoms to the standstill. You can use lasers to create uh, degenerate atomic gases such as Bose-Einstein condens uh, uh, condensation. Um, at the same time, people also uh, realized that you can use lasers to uh, build novel type of sensors, uh, and in particular, this is how the, the ideas, you know, of atomic clock uh, uh, came about. And uh, uh, and uh, um, uh, basically, the atomic clock uses, you know, light and some radiation, microwave or optical radiation, to build, uh, you know, the clocks, which by now, you know, can, you know, skip less than a second during the age of universe. Is actually perhaps the most precise instrument um, that um, uh, that that humankind have also ever built to date, you know? So, and, but actually what all of these kind of directions show you that this field, quantum optics, is kind of very special because it actually combines something which is actually really, you know, fundamental, like cutting edge research with something which actually is kind of useful for humankind. And to be maximally honest, this is what attracted me to this field to begin with, you know? But back in 2000s, uh, uh, what, what were like the problems I, I recall um, at that time there was like Nobel prizes for the BEC for the Bose-Einstein condensate. Like what what people look at that time? So it goes maybe when back even like to nine uh, to kind of early to mid nineties, where for example the ideas for this kind of laser you know manipulation of atoms have been very well established, and in particular in nineteen ninety five Bose-Einstein condensation has been created of of of, of dilute atomic gas. And that by itself has been like an outstanding goal for, you know, a couple of decades. People have been thinking about it. Um, and um, I mean, this both Einstein condensation was also kind of another example of like application, you know, or solution looking for application. People did not quite know what to do with that, you know. Um, uh, but, you know, it enabled a lot of, you know, cool scientific, you know, kind of exploration, studying many body physics, studying, you know, in a very controlled environment. Um, and uh, uh, in some way, this work also paved the way to the kind of modern developments, you know, um, uh, of the type that we will be talking about today, in particular, kind of, you know, for um, applications in, for, in quantum information, in quantum computing, we really utilize, we almost take for granted mm -hmm. these kind of techniques, which are actually like completely non-trivial, you know, yeah. and, you know, and some of them, you know, 
Like if you think about it, could you predict that they will work well? You know, this was absolutely imp impossible, you know. So there was a lot of serendipitous development. There has been a lot of, you know, clever insights. And that's kind of the foundation um, on which we are building right now. Uh, um, like a follow-up question. So uh, like looking at the, your publications, uh, like back in, I see like in 2000, somewhere around 2016, 2017, uh, you very strongly, like your research group entered the field of uh, uh, doing this operations with uh, neutral atoms. So could you maybe tell us a story? Yes, what, what what happened at that time? Okay, so... Because people you know, have okay, been well, working for decades on okay, melter so, cold atoms. So basically when I came here, uh, so I was interested to like do some work in quantum information. I didn't quite know exactly what to do with it. It was the early times where... Um, uh, you know, Shor's algorithm was proposed. People started to think about quantum error correction, but it was at the time completely you know, blue sky research. You know, it was very hard to imagine that anyone would ever even start, you know, work in doing the experiments on this. It was also the time after Chirac and Zoller proposed the the first, what I would say, kind of realistic version to build a quantum computer using trapped ions. So and uh, uh, and one of the first, uh, one of our first contribution to this field was this kind of idea uh, involving uh, uh, so-called stopped light. You know, you might have also heard about it. So, so basically, and this idea was based based on electromagnetically induced transparency, which actually can be used to slow the light pulses. So it turns out if the light pulse kind of enters the medium. If you can control the group velocity, adjust the group velocity, you can actually slow the light pulse to basically a standstill. Uh, um, uh, and, uh, you know, we realized that this method can be used as a mechanism to store quantum information, to store a quantum state of light. So the story about how this actually idea emerged is also kind of interesting. Uh, so it was uh, uh, actually, it was around the time was a sick, uh, my advisor, Marlon Scully, you know, uh, had a 60th birthday. And um, uh, somehow there was a kind of a big party, there was a conference in, in, in Munich where, uh, you know, like a bunch of us was invited, but I could not go because I had like, I didn't have visa, but I couldn't like come back to the US. And, um, and actually, and, 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 and so, my, so my wife was also a student of, of Marlon and, so she also could not go. So basically we were like, we had to think about something to, you know, like as a kind of present to write some paper for a, uh, like a special issue, you know, and, you know, we really had no idea what to write. And then we thought a little bit about this, you know, kind of stopping light sounds kind of cool, you know. And so we wrote the paper for this kind of obscure, you know, but, you know, and it like, as well, it's kind of sounds like an interesting idea. So, and, um, and actually, that kind of started this research direction on this stop light. And um, kind of also early on, uh, uh, like I realized, you know, uh, that one could actually demonstrate this idea using a version of the kind of experiment they built in Texas, you know. And uh, in uh, at the time, I was actually in the Center for Astrophysics here at, at Harvard. And Another person who was working there was Ron Walsworth. And actually in talking over coffee with Ron, we realized that he has actually most of the tools which we can build experiment, this experiment and demonstrate it. And this was uh, like, a, you know, something which we've done over a couple of months. It's actually like, it became like it landed on the front page of New York, <laughs> New York Times. You know, so, uh, but, but it was very clear at the time that this kind of operation, this, uh, um, kind of light storage and retrieval is actually a linear optical operation. So basically, if you, you want, can use it for memory, but you cannot use it to like process information. So to process information, you needed to kind of introduce some interaction, in this case, be, between atoms, because in you know, the light storage process, the state of the light, quantum state, is stored in the atomic state, in atomic excitation. And this was kind of the uh motivation to start thinking about the um, uh kind of exciting atoms in so-called Rydberg states so basically atoms typically uh, uh uh in the natural state is a ground state where electron is you know rotating very close to the nucleus you know but actually if you excite the atoms to the orbit uh 
where electron is far away, you know, it actually the effective size of the atom increases, and then atoms start talking to each other, uh, to each other. And um, this idea of like exciting atoms to a Rydberg state is a basic idea behind something which is called Rydberg blockade. You know, which actually allows one to, you know, uh, for example, create interactions between stored states in 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 light states stored in the atoms. But it's also the key ingredient behind this um, kind of recent wave of you know neutral atom quantum com computers. And so this idea we actually kind of it dates back to 2000, you know, and we initially started thinking about here at Harvard, but then actually Peter Zoller was visiting, uh, was at the time already very famous, you know, scientist. And, you know, we went for lunch and we started talking and then basically I kind of realized that these guys are not only thinking about similar idea, but, you know, they're very advanced, you know, and I was like, oh God, you know, this is famous, you know, scientist, you know, it's like, but then somehow we figured that we're thinking a little bit in a complementary direction. So we decided to join forces and we had, uh, you know, we wrote two papers, actually one kind of related more related to light storage and another one to more to quant related to quantum computing, where we use this idea of Rydberg blockade. So this was 2000, 2001. So when I was actually starting my group here in this building in 2001, I thought that this, you know, this Rydberg, you know, quantum information would be very cool. Uh, and I wanted, I, at the time, I clearly wanted to have my own, at least small experimental lab. But be, after thinking about this a little bit, you know, I realized that maybe it would be like too challenging to, at the time, to really build an experiment of this type. And the main reason uh, is that to excite atoms in the Rydberg states, you need wavelengths which are uh, much shorter than what's your six? 632. 32, <laughs> you know. So, so basically you need like, you know, blue and UV lasers. And at the time these lasers simply did not exist. So basically like it was sort of clear how one could build it by using, uh, you, know, wave, uh, you know, wave mixing and, you know, by using nonlinear optics. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it was clear that it will be like, you know, three, four year project to just build this laser. So that's actually sort of the reason why we did not start working on it in, in, in 2001. So had I been more confident, you know, maybe quantum computers would happen much earlier. So, but, um, but what happened was that then, uh, uh, basically other, uh, uh, groups started working, uh, on, uh, this, uh, topic and then um, around 2004 uh, Vlad and Vuletic came to MIT and um, uh, and we started um, and actually you know after you know a couple of kind of you know, brainstorming discussion we started actually experiment here at first here at Harvard uh, involving uh, kind of these Rydberg atoms more for the purposes of no quant of nonlinear optics not for the quantum computing but to really create nonlinear interactions between photons. So eventually we moved this experiment to MIT and Vladen's lab and actually ex it exists, you know, um, uh, up to now. And this experiment resulted in a kind of series of measurements where we can show that we could make single photons interact. So for example, this nice poster, actually I have to show you afterwards, is from Australian kid. It was kind of in response to some of these some of these experiment where we showed that we can have like attractive interactions between single photons. People thought it is like similar to lightsabers, you know, <laughs> and uh, and people got very excited. So I got like a kid who said, "Oh, can you send me a lightsaber?" You know, and I'll send you some money back. And his mom wrote some, you know, like and I, he wants some color glue, you know, some you know. He specified the, the color. color exactly. <laughs> specify the color. So. But okay, kind of more to the serious side. So basically, these experiments actually in, in there, there, this idea of Rydberg blockade actually worked very well. In parallel, there has been several research groups which have been trying to like develop, for example, pursue these quantum computers with the uh, with the Rydberg atoms. And while there was kind of early on, people showed that one could entangle atoms and one do logic. The problem uh, there was that. Um, quality of these logic operations were not very high. So basically the errors were, were a little bit, you know, were a little bit too high. So, and then by 2015, maybe or so, 
that was a status, so basically people thought, oh, this Rydberg blockade is kind of was a cool idea, but it really doesn't work very well. So there was clear front runners for quantum information or superconducting qubits and trapped ions. Uh, and, uh, uh, and like when we were talking about this here, we really could not understand what is basically the problem. Right, so we decided that we'll build an experiment, you know, small experiment to try to see whether we can entangle atoms and do, you know, quantum computing and quantum simulations with high fidelities. And uh, 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 we kind of started thinking about it, and but you know, it was like basically many people said, "Well, why do you don't? You know, people have tried it; it does not work." You know, people like were really not very encouraging. You know, um, and uh, and then uh, Manuel Andras. Uh, um, arrived uh, from Munich. He was actually a, a postdoc here, um, and he was planning to work on something completely different. But what happened is, by the time he arrived, between you know, we agreed that he comes, and he actually showed up here. He got an offer from Caltech, you know, and he was going to go there. And you know, I said, look, man, I mean, these people say that it's not going to work, but you know, you have a job, you know, why don't we give it a try? And so basically, with Manuel and a couple of you know students, and then eventually Hannes Bernian, who's now in. In Chicago, we kind of started building this um, this uh, programmable atom array. So that was the basis to this kind of 2017 uh, paper where we showed 50 atoms first, and then we extended it to you know uh, to larger systems. So we can now control you know in our lab over you know 500 qubits, you know. Yeah.